question of whether 587 <laughs> was the wasn't the start of the uh, uh, 70 weeks and, and uh, apparently we were moving too fast yesterday and we were describing the critical view that was on the critical view that 587 would be but maybe it would be useful just to put that up again on the critical view or at least the one form of that we were uh, taking they went from the destruction of Jerusalem up to the uh, uh, restoration uh, under Cyrus as being the first seven weeks. And uh, so on their view, that's the way it worked out. By the way, on, on their view, then, you, you have within the passage two different messiahs. Mm -hmm. they, they would see Cyrus as the messiah uh, who brought about the restoration from... Uh, uh, from that. And, and, and as we've seen, that that's a, a valid uh, a biblical uh, uh, understanding of the role of Cyrus. He, uh, he, he was a, a typological messiah, but then in terms of the 70 weeks passage, if the, the, they see Cyrus as the messiah uh, who comes at, according to them at the end of, of the, the seven weeks, that's part of this question of how to punctuate verse 25 that I better say a little bit more about. But the, they, they say that there are seven weeks from the beginning up to Messiah, the, the prince, and, and uh, Cyrus is that Messiah. And then the, the Messiah that uh, is dealt with in uh, the later uh, part of it is, is the one that they associate with the events of, of the times of the Maccabees, and uh, someone down there would be the anointed one who is the deliverer uh, as they start the, the the other weeks, uh, where do they started back here in 605? Uh, the, the, the eighth week and, and following uh, up until 165 or so. So that, uh, the, that had to do with uh, the, the, the critical view. Now, let's just say a little bit more about this, this other option. We just dealt with verse 25. And I understood that it was saying that from the going forth of the decree to the Messiah, there are seven plus 62 weeks or 69 weeks in all. Now, however, we noticed uh, that both the critics and also Kyle, uh, on, on his view of things, uh, he begins at the right place here in, in 539, but he understands the, the text to be punctuated, so it would be saying from the going forth of the decree unto the Messiah are seven weeks, period. And then he takes the 62 weeks as uh, what follows Christ. up to the Antichrist crisis at the end of the church history, which uh, the, then he, uh, uh, to which he assigns the 70th week. So the, here's this alternative <coughs> punctuation, and, and we should have a word of evaluation. Uh, why do we adopt this as 7 plus 62, 69 weeks to Messiah, rather than just seven weeks up to uh, the uh, uh, Messiah? For one thing, on uh, Kyle's view, the decree goes forth here to restore and to build. And we saw that the two verbs were shuv and bana. That's the, the decree to restore and to build Jerusalem. But then the actual building of it, which is described in, in, in verse 25b, is something that takes place down here. And that just flies in the face of the obvious. The, the text goes out of its way to connect the two things using the same two verbs, shuv and bana, to describe the decree to do it, and then the actual carrying out. For us, in his view, they, they would be <coughs> totally separate uh, ages from one another, and uh, that simply is, uh, it flies in the face of what the text is telling us. And you do end up then also with, with uh, different Nagi figures, or as I was emphasizing, remember, you read right away about the Mashiach Nagi, and subsequently, wherever we read about either one of those by itself, whether mes uh, Messiah or, or Prince, uh, must be referring back to one and the same figure. 
but on, on, on Kyle's view, you end up with the, the different uh, figures. And also on the critical view, uh, we saw that you end up with different uh, figures, whether Cyrus down there and one of the Maccabees uh, down here. Now, <coughs> when we're finished here with our general discussion, we'll come back and, and, and see some other problems involved in Kyle's view. The way he has to take the, the language of Messiah being cut off uh, something that happens at the end of the church age, the way he has to understand that the words of the destruction of the city is referring to, to the church itself, uh, the, these things uh, are, are just not, not uh, fitting, and we'll come back to that. But for the moment, uh, uh, we are just rejecting the, the punctuation of verse 25a that would uh, uh, just give the, s the seven weeks up to uh, Messiah. Now let's get back to our text here, and we've seen then that 25b went back and picked up the first seven weeks and told us how the city would be restored inside and out, but in distress of, of the times. And then two verses, 26 and 27, are given over to the description of the work of Mashiach Nagi. And uh, verse 26 then starts by giving him his place within the 70-week pattern by saying, after the Shavuim, Shishim, Ushanayim, after the weeks 60 and 2. So, all right. After the 62 weeks, which is to say at the end of the 69th week, something will happen which will end that and will institute the next period. So after the week 60 and 2, Yikarit Mashiach. The Messiah has already been uh, referred to as Mashiach Nagid. Now he's referred to simply as Mashiach. And it speaks about his being cut off. And we shouldn't have any problem recognizing what's going on here. It's, it's the verb the karat, which is used karat barit, to cut a covenant, and so the, this is covenantal stuff. And uh, he, he is cut off, and uh, this, of course, uh, drives us to, to the New Testament in interpretation of the death of Jesus as the blood of the covenant, and we've seen that m motif, and we dealt with Genesis 49, the Shiloh figure, uh, this is interpreted in Zechariah 9. He's the one who, who sheds the that the blood of the covenant was cut off in order to uh, uh, to establish the uh, covenant, or the the legal foundation for the uh, in, in new covenant uh, order. And uh, in addition to that, and amplifying it, it uh, says, "Wain lo, Messiah is cut off on the cross, and there is not to him." Now the, the possibilities uh, here. One is uh, perhaps that there was no fault in him. He, he is cut off even though there was no fault in, in, in him. Uh, or the thought is uh, rather that uh, he is cut off and, and, and again reflective of, of the Genesis 49, especially understood in terms of what Ezekiel does with it and, and <coughs> what some of the the NIV translations uh, did with it, as uh, you were explaining to me in the exams that I've looked at so far, uh, which uh, bring out the, the possibility of Asher Lo, huh? that which belongs to him, who, the Messiah is the, the, the one to whom the, the judgment and the royalty and the respect and the worship belongs, but what belongs to him, there is not to him. It would be just a very brief way of saying it. Wa'ain Lo, there is not to him. What is not to him? Well, what property belongs to him? They come and they say, we have no king but Caesar. That's not what Christ should hear. Uh, they should uh, come to him recognizing he is their <coughs> a, a divine king. But what belongs to him is not accorded to him. He is repudiated. He is rejected. He is cut off. And uh, all right, that, that would be then the message of the cross. So the 69 weeks end, and the, the cutting off of Christ ratifies the new covenant, and that's the 70th week, and so the title of my article was The Covenant of the 70th Week. That's what the 70th week is all about. It's the age of the new covenant from its ratification to its consummation. 
bringing in the, the eternal jubilee question. Yeah. Um, the word uh, karat, uh, Matter? the word karat, which uh, yeah. were cut, which you spoke of as being covenantal, is it also presuppose divine warrior building a sword cutting imagery? Cutting the community? <coughs> cutting off. I'm, yeah. just, I'm asking, can this word also be linked to the divine warrior imagery in the Old Testament? So that the divine warrior is wielding a sword, cutting off his covenant servant. Well, I, I, I don't think you know when you talk about the making of a covenant, it's it's not the military divine warrior context you're thinking about. You're thinking about the the uh, unless you know, it is of course the the, the judge who, who cuts them off uh, who, who inflicts the curse of the covenant is the same one who is pictured as the divine warrior. But I think that you would find that divine warrior image is used more in terms of, of of God going forth against the the, the nations of the world as, as uh, to destroy them, rather than as the the one who uh, who, uh, who judges the covenant community. I, I don't think those two images uh, overlap that much, uh, although it's the same person who who is in view in both. Uh, now, before going further, it's important, I think, to see the structure of verses 26 and 27. Each one has three parts. It looks like Hosea again. Huh? <coughs> each, each one has three parts. And uh, the first one has to do with the New Covenant, and the second two have to do with the Old Covenant. So the prophecy goes beyond what Daniel's immediate interest was by uh, uh, our concern by dealing with the New Covenant, but it actually uh, ends by returning to uh, a concentration on the Old Testament order and uh, what would happen there. So yes, there's going to be the fullness. But the prophecy comes to a conclusion with a heavy emphasis uh, uh, in, uh, on the fall, <coughs> the fall of Israel. So yes, Daniel, the city will be restored, uh, but uh, in terms of the typological order, you, that's not where you want to pin your hopes. You want to be looking beyond the typological order to, to the antitype because the old order is going to go down the drain again, and, and more so than ever. In, in, in 70 AD. So this is the structure. And what's useful then is to, in the interpretation of, of individual lines, it, it will be helpful to see the, the correspondence across the, the board. Uh, now, for example, we just had Karat, but we didn't have Barit in, in 26A. When you turn to 27A, you get the Barit. And so it's sort of a poetic thing almost, that the, the two passages beside each other uh, end up having the, this kind of parallelism and, and, and connection with one another. So 26A and 27A have to do with uh, the cutting, with the covenant, both the cutting. Now it turns out that it's another verb than karat is used in, in 27A. It's the verb they think here, uh, which points beyond just the mere ratification of the covenant uh, to the complete fulfilling of it, and we'll come back to that. But for the moment, then, 26A describes the beginning of the 70th week in terms of the messianic accomplishment, the establishment of, of uh, the new covenant order. So after uh, 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off and there will not be to him the, the, the proper respect and so on, worship that uh, belongs to him. Now the result then is then that Messiah will begin to act in, in a fulfilling another role. He, he is the priest. Hmm? He is the priest who, who makes an atonement. And by the way, you, you can see the, the fulfillment of that second pair of purposes. He, he, he will make an atonement for sin, and he will bring an everlasting righteousness. So uh, 26A and 27A are the, the story of, of how that pair of purposes was carried out, the bringing in of an atonement, huh? when Messiah is cut off, and uh, the bringing in of everlasting uh, righteousness as he fulfills uh, all the terms of the covenant, uh, uh, 27 uh, a, a. And then by the same token, 26 B and C and 27 B and C 
tell us the story of the fulfillment of that first pair of, uh, of purposes in verse 24, namely to put an end to sin and, and, and to uh, transgression. But now we, we move then from the Messiah as the one who as, as priest makes atonement for sin and is cut off and so on, to the role of Messiah as the avenger. Hmm? He is, is the avenger uh, uh, of the covenant. He, he is repudiated. They will not accept him as king, but now he acts as a king, and he acts as a king who, who avenges his, the dishonor that has been brought to him uh, by wiping out uh, the, the old uh, order. Verse uh, 26b. Now. As for the city and the Chodesh, now you see here there's no question about Chodesh being the temple. Hmm? And that's why, in the whole context, I've been interpreting code as not just in the general sense of something that's holy, but concretely the temple. So as for the city, and as for the temple, now, yashit am nagid haba. All right? The subject is the nagid. Up above, he was called Mashiach nagid. In verse 26a, he was just called Mashiach. Now in 26b, he's called a nagid. But as I said before and say again, you just can't miss it. This is the same person, one and the same person. The combined title is just being taken apart one item at a time to describe these different things. So uh, nagid it has to be Mashiach nagid. It's, it's Christ who is in view here. And we read about the Am Nagid. Now, Am means people, but in military context, very often army is a, is a very good translation for this a word Am. So it's, it's the army of the prince. Now the next word, the participle Habba, uh, the coming one, could refer to either the word Am, army, or Nagid, people. I take it, uh, you know, if it were to the army, you would simply say, uh, that there is an army that's going to come and is going to destroy the city. But it is uh, so common uh, a, a designation of the Messiah that he is the coming. Again, Genesis 49 uh, and uh, Zechariah 9, behold, your king comes. Uh, uh, until Shiloh comes, Messiah is the coming one. Hmm? And I think it's better to take it that way. And so the messianic prince who is to come, his army is going to destroy the city and the temple. Now there's the picture of, of Jesus as the destroyer of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Now of course he uses his uh, earthly agents just as Yahweh Elohim, the, uh, uh, the Lord in the Old Testament used the Babylonians uh, to come and to uh, work his, his judgment and he used Nebuchadnezzar. Huh? It was Nebuchadnezzar's army that, that uh, came and, and uh, affected the, the exile. And uh, so in 70 AD, to which this passage is referring, huh? uh, it, it was, of course, the, the, the Roman armies uh, that, that came and, and destroyed uh, the city. But they were just the instruments of the Christ of heaven who, who used them to affect his purposes of judgment uh, against his uh, own people. And so that's the thought here. And uh, if uh, one needs... A, a little evidence of the way in, in uh, uh, of this understanding of, of Jesus himself, the Lord is the one who destroys the city. Uh, we uh, can find that kind of evidence in those parables of Jesus in Matthew uh, 21 and, uh, and, and 22. Maybe we could just turn quickly to that. <clears throat> But the, it's, a it's a virtual interpretation of our text uh, that we get <coughs> in these uh, parables, uh, especially the one of the wedding banquet in Matthew 22. But already in Matthew 21, yeah, around verse 33 through 43. So there's a description of which we've referred to before when we were talking, I think, about the lawsuit. And uh, the landowner planted the vineyard, and he, he, he sends uh, to, to get his uh, due from them. They seize his servants, they, they beat them, they killed them. Last of all, he sent his son to them. 
and they will respect my son, he said, but the result is that the son Karat, as uh, we've just read this, in, instead of receiving the respect that uh, was, was due to him as the, the son of the uh, landowner, uh, he is cut off and there is not to him. So they say, let's kill him and let's take his inheritance. And uh, they did so, and therefore when the owner of the vineyard comes, and of course the owner of the vineyard in the parable is referring to the Lord himself, uh, what will he do to those tenants? And then they an announce their own judgment when they say he will, he will destroy them and so on. So in, in a general way, of course, here the, the Lord is pictured then as the one who actually destroys uh, Jerusalem and its uh, uh, citizenry. And then in the following chapter, the parable of, of the banquet, it's even a, a clearer reference uh, to our Daniel context. And uh, the, those who are not in, in uh, are the, those who refuse to come and, and to obey the invitation, who paid no attention uh, to them and uh, and mistreated the representatives of the king. The result was, verse seven, that the king was enraged. Now in the parable, once again, the king is the Lord. The king is the Lord, and it says the king was enraged. And now notice, he sent his army. Now there you are. That's Daniel nine. 26, 26b, the army of the coming prince will come and destroy the city. And here's Jesus' interpretation. The king was enraged. He sent his army, the Romans in this case, and they destroyed those murderers and they burned their city. So in the light of uh, Matthew 22, uh, verse 7, I don't think we should have any hesitation in interpreting Daniel 9, uh, 26b. Uh, And then underscoring that, that there are two sections now given to uh, this theme. Und underscoring that is the, the message of 26C, which says, and its end, Kitso, its end, that is the end of the city of Jerusalem, the event of 70 AD, is with a shetep, with a flood. It's an overwhelming. <coughs> Uh, flooding catastrophe and odd Kate's until the very end Milchama hmm? there is war <coughs> and then the last two words you have the, a participle uh, we earlier saw that word Harutz describing the the rebuilding of the city inside in Harutz we uh, it took uh, not as a passive participle of this verb meaning to determine but as a as a mode but here definitely it, it is the verb which means to determine and it's a nifal participle here and uh, so it, it, the translation would be that which has been determined see this all goes back to the yatsat davar uh, God on his heavenly throne issues the decrees as to what's going to happen on earth and that which has been determined uh, uh, up there in heaven and decreed by God is as far as the old author is concerned all summed up in one word, shomemot, desolations. That's the final word for the old order, the fall of Jerusalem, 70 AD, shomemot, uh, desolations. So 26 B and C make that point. And Messiah, Mashiach Nagid, is the one who executes the shomemot, the desolations on, on, on that city. Now then, moving on to verse uh, 27, we move through the same series once again. The first line refers to the establishing, and not just the establishing, but the total fulfilling of the uh, New Covenant uh, order. And the story of that is the story of the verb gaver, here, the hippial form higbir, translating, and he will cause to prevail, he will fulfill the terms of, uh, it's not karat notice, huh? 26a had to do with the inauguration of the new covenant order, the, the inauguration, the beginning of the 70 weeks. 27a is pointing more toward the ultimate fulfillment of it. <coughs> At the end of 27a, we have the, 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 the expression one week. Hmm? We had the 69 weeks, and now the 70th week. 26a said after the 69th week. 27a says in the course of the one week. In the course of that one week. What's that one week uh, left for? What's it going to do? 
within that one week, within this church age, it will serve for Christ to fulfill completely all of the terms. He will bring his people through this semi-eschatological age to the age of consummation, glorification, and the anointing of the eternal holy of holies, the ultimate uh, the jubilee. So, uh, 27 then. He, whatever verb we can use for that, avoiding the verb to make a covenant, because that's not the verb that's used here. Hmm? And uh, here, here's another problem then, a major problem that uh, you, you encounter in the dispensationalist scheme, because, uh, you know, they have stopped seeing Christ as the subject of, uh, of this action. Actually, this is... There's only that one central figure, Mashiach Nagid, and he is the subject of all, everything that's going on. Whether blessing or destruction, it's all coming from him. Dispensationalism misses that, and in fact substitutes the Antichrist, or, or Satan, for Christ as the subject of these verbs. And uh, at this point, uh, then translates this uh, with the thinking of, uh, of Satan, or Antichrist, uh, that, uh, that he... Higbir, they translate, makes a covenant then with the Jews for one week and uh, with the reality that in the midst of the week he, he breaks that covenant and so on, introducing the great tribulation. This is not what the text says. This is not uh, the, the verb karat, it's the verb higbir, uh, which does not mean uh, to, uh, to uh, just to ratify a, a covenant, uh, but it's uh, a, a verb that has to do with the with uh, the, the effective, faithful fidelity in, in, uh, of carrying out the, 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 all the terms of, uh, of the commitments that, that have been uh, made. <coughs> and it was the discussion uh, of that particular term that uh, occupies uh, uh, quite a bit of that article that I wrote about the covenant of the 70th week, and I'll come back to that maybe in a little bit, but uh, let's just maybe complete this interpretation and come back for that uh, confirming evidence of the meaning of Hibir afterwards. So looking at 27a, what it is saying is that in the course of that one week, the last two words, Shavua Echad, uh, understood of in the course of, not, not that he will make an arrangement that's going to last for one week, no, but in the course of that one last week, in that 70th week, what will he accomplish? What he will accomplish uh, then is that he will bring to pass all of the, the commitments of his Barit, and that he, the new covenant commitments that he had made, and now another term that's thrown in here that, that should tell you right away that that's what it's talking about. It's talking about Christ and, and, and the new covenant. It's talking about the servant of the Lord who was cut off, uh, who was despised and rejected, uh, where aim low and there is not to him that which he, he uh, belongs to him. And uh, yet he is uh, the, the one who, who uh, brings to pass all of the terms of the covenant. For whom? For whom? It's the one and the many, and eh? Isaiah and the servant, isn't it, huh? It, it's the one who does it for us, the, 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 the many. And uh, that's the uh, expression here, la rabim. It's, it's the second Adam scheme, the one and the many. What he does, he does in behalf of, of the many whom he represents. It is for them he makes the atonement. Uh, it is for, for them that he brings an everlasting uh, uh, righteousness. It is for them that he fulfills all the terms of uh, the new covenant in the course of this final of uh, 70 at the uh, uh, we, as I say, we come back to that and uh, elaborate a little bit more. But meanwhile, then, it once again moves on in, in the 27 B and, and C to describe not Christ, uh, the uh, one who is uh, the, the priestly uh, sufferer, uh, but it is uh, the one who exercises his judicial uh, avenging uh, role uh, as uh, the Lord of the Covenant and uh, brings on Israel the days of uh, vengeance. And uh, th that's described then. So looking at 27b, the language says, in the midst of the week. Now here we come to that division of the 70th week into two parts. So the 70th week consists, of course, of, of seven years. And if it is uh, divided in two, we end up with three and a half and three and a half. And, and this three and a half symbol, especially from uh, the fall uh, from 70 AD on to the end of the age, the, the, the bulk of the church age, uh, the time of the, the church now disengaged from any overlap with the old covenant, from 70 AD to the consummation, that three and a half year symbol becomes quite common in, in Daniel, as a matter of fact, uh, we're encountering it here in Daniel 9, but it's also in Daniel 7, and it's also in Daniel 12. 
memory and the structure of the book, you had uh, those chiasms with uh, 2, 7, and, and 12. And uh, so in, in chapter 7 and 12, and here at this centerpiece of this chiasm, you get these references to the three and a half years, which of course equals 42 months, which of course equals 1260 days. So it's variously referred to, but it's always the same time period. And, and uh, this becomes a, an exegetical question too in the book of Revelation, where, where it picks up on, uh, on this way of describing the church age, once again, in terms of time or 1260 days or 42 months. And I, I think that any exegetical appropriate in, as, re, as having the same referent wherever it appears in Daniel in the book of Revelation uh, be taking it. So, but here, here's the, the, a clear where the three years uh, is the church age from 70 AD uh, right down to the, the end. In the midst of, the, of, of that week, that final week we found in Hosea, you remember, huh? Hosea more than once Use the verb Shavat uh, uh, with the thought of not consummating but bringing something to an end when we're speaking about God's judgment brought to an end. And that same pun now is used here with the thought that, that uh, he will bring to an end. Now, now, the thing is jubilee. It, it's a symbolism with a, a thought of, of the Sabbath as the complete consummation, rest and so on. And yet within that context, uh, on the thought of the, the verb Shavat uh, and, and using it in the opposite sense, for those who are the, uh, the objects of his, his vengeance, he, he, he brings to an end Zevak and Minka's sacrifice for erection of this form of 26 and 27. The parallelism is helpful to us. One of the ways in, in which uh, 27b has been understood, he brings to an end sacrifice and oblation. He's the priest. Huh? And uh, so the whole system of sacrifices and priests that had uh, been the order of the day all for these years they're all obviated that now they're all obsolete because the real thing, the once for all act has taken place. And so 27b has been understood as describing Christ as the priest who by his cross does away with symbolic typological sacrifices of the Old Testament. But the structure of the passage speaks in a different direction. It, it, uh, 27b is describing not Christ as priest, it's describing Christ as king once again. 27b corresponds to 26b, and 26b was the story of how Christ the Avenger <coughs> sends his army and he destroys the city. And of course, in destroying the city, he also destroys the temple and puts to an end the whole Old Testament cultus and thus brings the uh, Old Testament sacrifice and oblation uh, uh, to an end, not just in principle, but in fact, huh? uh, by destroying the, the, the temple and the, the whole location of of the thing. So uh, 27b, like 26b, is a picture of Christ the Avenger, the, uh, uh, the, the king who, who brings judgment on, on those who have, have refused uh, him. And uh, the confirmation of that is to look again at, at 27c, and then at the, the, the final phrase, which like 26c underscores the thought of, of the destruction of Jerusalem. Hmm? And so 27c Again, it's certainly the destruction of Jerusalem, and uh, B and C should thus be un understood uh, uh, agreeably one with another. Well, this last line then has its difficulties. Uh, we, we have the, the help of our Lord's own interpretation, the eschatological discourse, uh, where he then uh, interprets this uh, of, of the 70 AD event, so the, we know how to go. And uh, it says, upon, upon the Kanaf Shikutsim. Now that's going to be the object of judgment. Jud judgment is coming. And the object of judgment is called the Kanaf Shikutsim. The one who inflicts this, the judgment, the, the subject of, of this action, is described by the next word, the form of which you should uh, note. It's a polial form from this uh, verb shaman, uh, mishomim, mishomim. And what it means is to make desolate, to make desolate. Not to be confused with the last word in the sentence, and this is a major thing in translation, and where the NIV uh, then has a bad fault. Uh, the, the last word in the, the sentence is the same uh, root, but it's uh, not the polil, it's the cal. And the, the meaning of the pole ale is, is to make something desolate, and the meaning of the cow is to be desolate, and they shouldn't be confused. 
And uh, so this first one, then, Mishomim, describes the action of, of desolating, bringing judgment or ruin uh, upon something. And who is the Mishomim? Well, once again, it's only one figure all the way through, the one who sends his armies to destroy the city. He's the Mishomim. Mashiach Nagi is the Mishomim. Christ is the desolator of, of Jerusalem. And uh, the object of his desolation, a desolating act, is called the Kanaf Shikutsim. Kanaf means the wing, means the extremity uh, of something. Uh, Shikutsim, abominations. Upon the extremity of abominations, upon the wing of abominations. Um, the reference seems to be, of course, to Jerusalem and, and the temple. And uh, Kana, uh, the, the wing. So we're uh, uh, referred to an architectural feature of, of the structure of the, the temple, uh, something called the, the wing that uh, would have been destroyed by uh, the, the Roman armies or, or so on. I don't think that's uh, what, what's going on, on here. Shikutsim, uh, the abomination, uh, is uh, well. Uh, another view of the matter is that the, that the Roman armies themselves uh, are, are the ones who introduced the abomination into the temple. That the temple is thought of as being a, a proper and sacred place, but when Titus and his armies come, then the thought is that they they intrude into the the, the holy precincts, the, the some some pagan idolatrous uh, insignia of, of some kind. And, and thus introduce abominations into the, the, the temple. And uh, the Mishomim would then tend uh, to be referring uh, to uh, the, those who introduced uh, uh, the, those abominations into the temple. Now, I, I don't think that's on the, the right track either. It, it isn't uh, that the Romans introduce something that makes the temple to be an abomination. The temple is already an abomination. Uh, they have broken the covenant uh, that they have turned God's house of prayer into a den of thieves hmm? and, and uh, they have killed the, the holy one who uh, should be enthroned within the, the, the holy of, of holies and, and so they have utterly perverted the, the nature of, of uh, the temple and, and, uh, and, and made it a place of abominations that was crying out to heaven for destruction hmm? uh, it, it was no longer something that God could own and honor a, a, as, as his own he repudiates uh, uh, it uh, because they have repudiated it to him and so the, the picture then is one of, of Christ who comes and, and visits upon this abominable Old Testament apostate situation, uh, the judgment uh, which, is, uh, which is due, the wrath of God now coming upon them to the uttermost. And so I would tend then also to uh, understand the kanaf in the sense of, of the extreme. Hmm? They have not only killed the servants uh, whom the Lord of the vineyard uh, or, or the uh, the king inviting to the banquet to have sent to them, but they have said that this is the son, huh? let's kill him. That's the extreme of abominations, and, and the, the, the king won't tolerate anything further, but in his wrath, I was going to destroy uh, the city. So upon the extremity of abominations, the ultimate apostasy that's been committed by the Old Covenant Order, Christ comes now as, as the self-avenging Mishomain desolator, and then just in general terms, summing up the whole thing once again, just as 26 C had, had summed it all up in terms of Shomemot and so on. So 27 uh, C does uh, the this, uh, this same. And it says, unto Kala, uh, unto a, a total annihilation, unto a, uh, a total uh, ruin. And now, once again, we have that verb Karats that we saw with the thought, that which is determined, huh? What, what God has decreed as the final word for the Old Testament order unto a final ruin and destruction that which is determined will pour out upon upon what? Not upon the desolator it's not Mishomain but upon that which had been desolated namely the, the city and the temple Shomain. So that's the final word on the subject. The ultimate thing that the, 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 the ultimate outcome that is is, is, is decreed, destruction will be poured out with total finality upon Shomain, upon that desolate Old Testament uh, order of things. 
Now, maybe since we mentioned NIV, let, let me just check and make sure that that's, uh, I guess I have an NIV here. here. Um, Let's see. In the middle of the sevens, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering, and on a wing of the temple, okay, they took it in that architectural sense, I guess, and on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation. Uh, now, that's missing uh, the, the role of Christ as the, the desolator, and, and who would be the subject? Uh, we're going to have to back up a while to find out uh, uh, how they're regarding the, the unspecified subjects of these different verbs. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And so this ruler is uh, not the same as the Messiah who's been cut off, whoever they are thinking about. Huh? The uh, people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Dispensationalists who would be understanding that this by Antichrist, wouldn't they? Huh? And uh, and if they're referring it at all to 70 A.D., uh, they would be saying that the the Roman armies in 70 A.D. were the armies of the Antichrist because as, as they uh, see things, Antichrist establishes the, the revived Roman Empire. So there's that tentative kind of weak linkage between the two things. I don't know if that's what the NIV was trying to do all. Though I think they were trying to keep the door open for the uh, the dispensationalist uh, uh, market. Hmm? <laughs> to, to <laughs> <laughs> um, the people of the ruler will come, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many. Uh, I guess that would be this ruler, huh? It isn't Messiah, certainly, huh? Uh, he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. Now that sounds like the dispensationalist view. The Antichrist makes a covenant with the, the Jews for for one week, and in the middle of the sevens, he will put an end to sacrifice. Yeah, this sounds very much like they're following the whole dispensationalist line in their NIV translation. And he will put an end to sacrifice and, and oblation. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. The desolator becomes, uh, uh, so they are trying to say that the uh, Antichrist makes a covenant. In the middle of it, he desolates the city, and, and then God judges uh, him subsequently, and, and he becomes made desolate. That is not what the text is talking about whatsoever. Uh, that's a complete uh, abuse, uh, certainly, of the, the Hebrew terms. One is the desolator, and uh, the other is the desolated. And now uh, the way they put it, uh, the, the the end is decreed uh, is poured out on him. Their translation of of Shomaim is him, uh, and uh, and he is the desolator, but he is not the the one that has already been desolated. This is this, uh, this is tragic. Uh, and uh, let's look at the footnote. If you look at your footnote in an NIV, it, it also then says, and one who causes desolation will come upon the pinnacle of the abominable temple. This, this sounds better. Mm -hmm. Until the end that is decreed is poured out <coughs> on the desolate city. <coughs> yeah, I, I wrote to uh, Ed Palmer, who was the, the editor of the NIV, uh, after this thing came out, and I said that I thought perhaps the single worst translation in, in this uh, was this particular verse. And I told him, you know what it should say, and so he put that in the footnote. And so you'll recognize the footnote as, as the exegesis I just gave you here. But the text itself still goes with that dispensationalist market, and that's a disaster. And uh, so, but uh, it's just about time to stop, I'm afraid. But it, it very much then depends on, on, on recognizing the difference between the polio and, 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 and the, the, the cow forms. And uh, so we'll have to discuss that, and we want to do a little bit more with the verb higbeer and so on.